Thanks for the response, Cream. Uh, I wrote a letter to Adam a few weeks ago, but he never responded, so I wasn't expecting you to either. It truly means a lot that you took the time to respond to my letter, but there are still a lot of disagreements that I have with you. Also, I like the music you played in your video, and I saw that Dead Mouse logo in the background, and I'm a pretty big fan of Dead Mouse myself, so I figured I'll play some Dead Mouse in the background of my response. I really appreciate that. Yes, I am. I don't want you to feel ignored, and I really took this time to respond to you because you were very polite. Thanks, Cream. Faisal Seed Al Mutar said, People deserve respect. Ideas, cultures, and beliefs don't. I agree with him, but I don't give out respect for free. My respect has to be earned. I'm not sure if you checked my channel before making your videos, but I have made videos mocking Islam before, but because you stood out to me as somebody who was very kind and respectful, I thought it would be best that I take a more diplomatic approach for my letter to you. Some people criticized me and said I was too soft and apologetic in my video, but I don't at all regret how it turned out. Why is it dangerous when I say that Islam is a religion of peace? It is a religion of peace. I'm going to have to disagree with you here. This is a list of terrorist attacks I found on Wikipedia. Note the political ideology behind these attacks. 80% of them are labeled as Islamic extremism. Considering how often this happens, I don't even feel like extremism is the right word. I prefer to use terms like Islamism or Jihad. Now of course, I'm not saying all Muslims are violent, but it is apparent to me that Islam has a problem with violence. Does Islam promote violence? Islam doesn't promote violence or peace. Islam is just a religion, and like every religion in the world, it depends on what you bring to it. If you're a violent person, your Islam, your Judaism, your Christianity, your Hinduism is going to be violent. There are Buddhist, marauding Buddhist monks in Myanmar slaughtering women and children. Does Buddhism promote violence? Of course not. 
people are violent or peaceful, mm -hmm. and that depends on their politics, their social world, the way that they see their communities, the so way they see so themselves. So so, Reza, you don't think that there's anything more, there's the justice system in Muslim countries, you don't think, is somehow more primitive or subjugates women more than in other countries? Did you hear what you just said? You said in Muslim countries. Mm. I just told you that Indonesia, women are absolutely 100% equal to men. Mm. In Turkey, they have had more female representatives, more female heads of state in Turkey than we have in the United yes, States. But in Pakistan, Stop women saying are, things like in Pakistan, Muslim countries. Women are still being stoned. And that's to death. a problem for Pakistan. So, You're in right. other words, so you, let's okay, I, just, no, I just want to be clear on what your point is because I thought you and Bill Maher were saying the same thing. Your point is that. Muslim countries are not to blame. There is nothing particular, there's no common thread in Muslim countries. You can't paint with a broad brush that somehow their justice system or Sharia law or what they're doing in terms of stoning and, and female mutilation is different than in other countries like Western countries. Mm -hmm. Stoning and mutilation and those barbaric practices should be condemned and criticized by everyone. The actions of individuals and societies and countries like Iran, like Pakistan, like Saudi Arabia must be condemned because they don't belong in the 21st century. But to say Muslim countries as though Pakistan and Turkey are the same, as though Indonesia and Saudi Arabia are the same, as though somehow what is happening in the most extreme forms of these repressive countries, these autocratic countries, is representative of what's happening in every other Muslim country is frankly, and I use this word seriously, stupid. Country is frankly, and I use this word seriously, stupid. This word seriously, stupid. Frankly, and I use this word seriously, stupid. So let's stop doing that. Okay. There is a very real problem. ISIS is a problem. Al-Qaeda is a problem. These militant Islamic groups like Hamas, like Hezbollah, like the Taliban have to be dealt with. But it doesn't actually help us to deal with them when instead of talking about rational conflicts, rational criticisms of a particular religion, we instead so easily slip into bigotry by simply painting everyone with a single brush, as we have been doing in this conversation, mind you. Well, um, we're just asking the questions, Reza, and you're answering. And I think you answered very fairly, and we appreciate it. Thank you, Reza Aslan. Mm -hmm.
Thank you very much, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Lovely to see you all here tonight. We are having a very entertaining night, are we not? With some very interesting things being said uh, from the other side of the house tonight. Um, let me begin by saying, as a Muslim, as a representative of Islam, I would consider myself an ambassador for Islam, a believer in Islam, a follower of Islam and its prophet. So in that capacity, let me begin by apologizing to Anne-Marie for the Bali bombings. I apologize for the role of my religion and me and my people, uh, for the killing of Theo van Gogh for 7-7. Seven, seven. Yes, that was all of us. That was Islam, that was Muslims, that was the Quran. I mean, astonishing, astonishing claims uh, to make in the very first speech tonight on a day like today, where the Conservative Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is having to come out and point out that these kind of views are anathema. And I believe you're trying to stand for the Labour Party to become an MP in Brighton. If you do uh, and you make these comments, I'm guessing you'll have the whip withdrawn from you. But then again, UKIP's on the rise. They'll take you, the BNP. They might have uh, something to say about your views. What Nadi Hassan always says. By the way, 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 just on a factual point, since we heard a lot about the second speaker, about how backward we Muslims all are. On a factual point, you said that Islam was born in Saudi Arabia. Islam was born in 610 AD. Saudi Arabia was born in 1932 AD. So you were only 1,322 years off. Not bad. Not bad start there. Uh, talking of maths, by the way, a man named Al Qawarizmi was one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, a Muslim, worked in the golden age of Islam. He's the guy who came up with not just algebra, but algorithms. Without algorithms, you wouldn't have laptops. Without laptops, Daniel Johnson tonight wouldn't have been able to print out his speech in which he came to berate us Muslims for holding back the advance and intellectual achievements of the West. Daniel Johnson tonight wouldn't have been able to print out his speech in which he came to berate us Muslims for holding back the advance and intellectual achievements of the West, which all happened without any contribution from anyone else other than the Judeo-Christian people of Europe. In fact, Daniel David Levering, the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning historian and author of The Golden Crucible, points out that there would be no Renaissance, there would be no Reformation in Europe without the role played by Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd and some of the great Muslim theologians, philosophers, scientists in bringing Greek text to Europe. As for this being our university, I will leave that to the imagination as to who is our and who is there. Uh, I studied here too. Um, an astonishing, astonishing set of uh, speeches so far making this case tonight. Uh, a mixture of just cherry-picked quotes, facts and figures, self-serving, selective, a farrago of distortions, misrepresentations misinterpretations, misquotations. Uh, Daniel talked about my article in the New Statesman, which got me a lot of flack, where I talked about the anti-Semitism that is prevalent in some parts of the Muslim community, which indeed it is. Uh, of course, I didn't say in that piece that it was caused by the religion of Islam. In fact, uh, modern anti-Semitism in the Middle East was imported from, finish the sentence, Christian, Judeo-Christian Europe, where I believe some certain bad things happened to the Jewish people. In fact, Tom Friedman, Jewish American columnist in the New York Times, told me in this very chamber last week that he believed, had Muslims been running Europe in the 1940s, six million extra Jews would still be alive today. So I'm not going to take lessons in anti-Semitism from someone who's here to defend the Judeo-Christian values of a continent that murdered six million Jews. Uh, moving swiftly on. Moving swiftly on. Yes. Absolutely. Well, I'm about to make that point. No, no, no. I'm about to make that point. You're right. I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you 110%. That is my point. I don't think Europe is evil or bad. I'm a very proud European. I don't want to judge Europe on that basis. But if we're going to play this gutter game where we pull out the Bali bombing and we pull out examples of anti-Semitism in the Islamic community, then of course I'm going to come back and say, well, hold on. I mean, look, let's be very clear. Daniel here was a last minute replacement for Douglas Murray, who had to pull out. And Douglas and I have a well-documented differences. But to be fair to Douglas, as to be fair to Anne-Marie and to Peter, atheists. Atheists see all religions as evil, violent, threatening. What the problem I have with Daniel's speech is that Daniel comes here to write this robust defense of Christianity 
forgetting that his fellow Christians, people who said they were acting in the name of Jesus, gave us the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, the anti-Jewish pogroms, European colonialism in Africa and Asia, the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, not to mention countless arson and bomb attacks on abortion clinics in the United States of America to this very day. I would like a little bit of humility from Daniel first before he begins lecturing other communities and other faiths on violence, terror and intolerance. But, no thank you. Some water. Drink some water. But I would say this, to address the gentleman's very valid point here, I'm not going to play that game. I don't actually believe that Christianity is a religion of violence and hate because of what the LRA does in Uganda or what, uh, what crusaders did uh, to Jews and Muslims in Jerusalem when they took back the city in the 12th or 13th or whatever century it was. I believe that Christianity, like Islam, like pretty much every mainstream religion, is based on love and compassion and faith. I do follow a religion in which 113 out of the 114 chapters of the Quran begins by introducing the God of Islam as a God of mercy and compassion. I would not have it any other way. I don't follow a religion which introduces my God to me as a God of war, as some kind of Greek God of wrath, uh, as a God of hate and injustice. Not at all. As Adam pointed out, you go through the Quran and you see the mercy and the love and the justice. And yes, you have verses that refer to warfare and violence. Of course it does. This is not a motion about pacifism. I'm not here to argue that Islam is a pacifistic faith. It is not. Islam allows military action, violence in certain limited contexts. And yes, a minority of Muslims do take it out of that context. But is it religious? Well, we talked about Woolwich. Daniel and Anne-Marie have suggested that it's definitely religion that's behind all of this. Well, actually, what I find so amusing tonight is we're having a debate about Islam. And the opposition tonight have come forward. We have a graduate in law, a graduate in modern history, a graduate in chemistry. Uh, and, you know, I admire all of their intellects and their abilities, but we don't have anyone who's actually a, an expert on Islam, a scholar of Islam, a historian of Islam, a speaker of Arabic, even a terrorism expert or a security expert or a pollster, let alone to talk about what Muslims believe or think. Instead, we have people coming here, putting forward these views, putting forward these sweeping opinions. Listen to Professor Robert Pape of the University of Chicago, one of America's leading terrorism experts experts who, unlike our esteemed opposition tonight, studied every single case of suicide terrorism between 1980 and 2005, 315 cases in total. And he concluded, and I quote, there is little connection between suicide terrorism and Islamic fundamentalism or any of the world's religions. Rather, what nearly all suicide terrorist attacks have in common is a specific secular and strategic goal to compel modern democracies to withdraw military forces from territory that the terrorists consider to be their homeland. And the irony is, when we talk about terrorism, the irony is that the opposition and the Muslim terrorists, the Al-Qaeda types, actually have one thing in common. Because they both believe that Islam is a warlike, violent religion. They both agree on that. They have everything in common. Osama bin Laden would be nodding along to everything he's heard tonight from the opposition side. He agrees with them. <laughs> the problem is, the problem is that mainstream Muslims don't. The majority of Muslims around the world don't. In fact, a gentleman here started quoting all sorts of polls. Gallup carried out the biggest poll of Muslims around the world of 35,000, 50,000 Muslims in 35 countries. 93% of Muslims rejected 9-11 and suicide attacks. And of the 7% who didn't, they all, when polled and focus grouped, cited political reasons for their support for violence, not religious reasons. And as for Islamic scholars and what they say, well, Daniel talks about our University of Oxford. We'll go down to Oxford's Centre for Islamic Studies, get hold of a man named Sheikh Afifi Al-Akiti, who is a massively well-credentialed and well-respected Islamic scholar who has studied across the world, who in the days after 7-7 published a fatwa denouncing terrorism in the name of Islam, calling for the protection of all non-combatants at all times and describing suicide bombings as an innovation with no basis in Islamic law. Go and listen to Sheikh Tahir al-Qadri, one of Pakistan's most famous Islamic scholars, who published a 600-page fatwa condemning the killing of all innocents and all suicide bombings unconditionally without any ifs or buts. There's nothing new here. This is mainstream Islam, mainstream scholarship, which has said this for years. You don't go out and kill people willy-nilly in the high street or anywhere else on a bus or a mall based on verses of the Quran that you cherry pick without any context, any understanding, any interpretation or any commentary. Please. Well, it's, it's, it doesn't happen apparently. 
I didn't say it doesn't happen at all. I never said it didn't happen. I don't blame Islam. Yes, it's a very good point. And a lot of us, a lot of us are campaigning against that. And we're campaigning against it in the name of Islam. We're campaigning against it in the name of various interpretations of Islam. Anne-Marie comes and scares us with her talk of Sharia law. I would like to see the book of Sharia law. It doesn't exist. People argue over what Sharia law is. And you empower the extremists by saying there is only one version. You empower them all. I don't believe you Several took any interruptions, countries. Anne-Marie, so I think you should stay there for a moment. Several countries. Here's, here's what we're dealing with. Here's what we're countries. dealing with. We are dealing, I took your point, I took your point. Here we are dealing with a 1400 year old global religion followed by 1.6 billion people in every corner of the world, a quarter of humanity, of all backgrounds, cultures, ethnicities. And yet the opposition tonight wants to generalize, stereotype, smear in order to desperately win this debate. And here's my question, if we're gonna generalize and smear. If, okay, people say yesterday's bombers and we've got to be careful there's a trial going on, were yesterday's attackers, sorry, motivated by Islam? Big debate. I don't believe they were. Let's say they were. Let's say Faisal Shahzad, the Times Square bomber, was motivated by Islam. Let's assume for sake of argument uh, that Richard Reeves, the shoe bomber, was motivated by Islam. If Islam is responsible for these killings, if Islam is what is motivating these people, and Islam is therefore not a religion of peace or religion of war, then ask yourself this question, why aren't the rest of us doing it? Why is it such a tiny minority of Muslims are interpreting their religion in the way that the opposition claim they are? Let's assume there are 16,000 suicide bombers in the world. There aren't. Let's assume there are for the sake of argument. That's 0.001% of the Muslim population globally. What about the other 99.99% of Muslims who the opposition tonight either ignore or smear? The reality is that the rest of us aren't blowing ourselves up tonight. The reality is that the opposition came here tonight not worried about the fact that me and Adam might pull, pull open our jackets and blow ourselves up tonight because we're followers of a warlike warrior religion which wants to take over Europe and Daniel's university. The issue is this. <laughs> the issue is this. Unless the opposition can tell us tonight, and Peter Atkins is here, one of our great atheist intellectuals, can tell us tonight, can they can answer this question tonight, why don't the vast majority of Muslims around the world behave as violently and aggressively as a tiny minority of politically motivated extremists, then they might as well give up and stop pretending they have anything relevant to say about Islam or Muslims as a whole. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this to you. Think about what the opposite of this motion is. If you vote no tonight, think about what you're saying the opposite motion is. That Islam isn't a religion of peace, it's a religion of war, of violence, of terror, of aggression. That the people who follow Islam, me, my wife, my retired parents, my six-year-old child, that 1.8 million of your fellow British residents and citizens, that 1.6 billion people across the world, your fellow human beings, are all followers, promoters, believers in a religion of violence. Do you really think that? Do you really believe that to be the case? They say that in the Oxford Union, the most famous debate was in 1933, when Adolf Hitler looked out for the result of the king and country motion, where they voted against fighting for king and country, and Hitler was listening out for the result. Well, tonight, 80 years on, there are two groups of people around the world who I would argue are waiting for the result of tonight's vote. There are the millions of peaceful, non-violent, law-abiding Muslims, both in the UK, Europe, Asia, Africa, and beyond, who see Islam as the source of their identity, as a source of spiritual fulfillment, of hope of solace and there are the phobes the haters the bigots out there who want to push the clash of civilizations who want to divide all of us into them and us and ours and their ladies and gentlemen i urge you all not to fuel the arguments of the phobes and bigots don't legitimize their divisions don't legitimize their hate trust those Muslims who you know, who you've met, who you hear, who don't believe in violence, who do want you to hear the peaceful message of the Quran as they believe it to be taught to the majority of Muslims, the Islam of peace and compassion and mercy, the Islam of the Quran, not of Al-Qaeda. Ladies and gentlemen, I beg to propose this motion to the House. I urge you to vote yes tonight. Thank you very much for your time. This is a picture of Jane monks wearing masks to avoid breathing in and therefore harming insects. The feather dusters they're holding are to sweep the floor so they don't accidentally step on insects. Some Janes won't even eat root vegetables like potatoes or carrots because when they pull the vegetables out of the ground, they may harm insects or worms living there. Jainism actually is a religion piece, and this is something that Sam Harris has discussed before. The more extreme Janes become, the more peaceful they are. This has a complete opposite effect regarding Islam. The more extreme a Muslim becomes, the more likely they are to resort to violence. Jainism actually is a religion of peace. 
Jainism is a, that the core principle of Jainism is nonviolence. Gandhi got his nonviolence from the Jains. The crazier you get as a Jain, the less we have to worry about you. <laughs> it is. <laughs> this is, I mean, Jain extremists are, are actually, they are, they are paralyzed by their pacifism. Jane extremists just, they, they can't take their eyes off the ground when they walk lest they step on an ant. They filter every sip of water through cheesecloth lest they sw swallow and there, thereby kill a bug. I mean, needless to say, they're, they're vegetarian. So the problem, uh, notice, the problem is not religious extremism, okay, because extremism is not a problem if your core beliefs are truly nonviolent. That has nothing to do with my prophet. Please just stop it. It doesn't make any sense. That's not the message he sent. That's not what he meant. That's not why he came. So you can claim as much as you want to, but I assure you the man I follow was not the same. See, I know a man who forbade the cutting down of a plant who even spoke against those who had burnt an ant. So why is it that I simply can't understand how we claim to follow the same man? I mean, I know a man who forbade us from harming the innocent, saying he who does so would not only be prohibited from paradise, but he would not even smell its scent. So please tell me how what you're doing has anything to do with the message that he sent. This is the man who forbade us from even scaring cattle with a knife, saying you have no right to let the animal die twice. And when he was asked for advice, he'd reply, don't get angry, don't get angry, don't get angry, repeating it thrice. See, I know a man who called to patience first, even to those who had treated him the worst. And when he was asked to invoke Allah's wrath, he said, I was not sent to curse but rather as a mercy to the earth. Matter of fact, the entire universe, meaning everything that was made. See, this is a man whom the clouds would rush to shade, a man to whom the trees would sway and the birds would flock to seek his aid. For they knew he was a man of justice, a man who would never betray, a man who could be trusted even by those who had wanted him slain. See, Anas bin Malik served him for 10 years and not once had he heard him complain. For he would never get angry for himself, but only for Allah's sake. And he never responded to evil with evil, but rather he pardoned and forgave. For had he been harsh hearted, the people would have ran away. So what is it that we still don't understand when we claim to follow Islam, yet we fail to follow this man? I mean, I know a man who was so caring and compassionate, who said that there is a reward in serving all things that are animate. In other words, everything that breathes, whether it be the animals, the trees, and every single human being. I mean, if Allah called him Rahmatan lil alameen, how dare you call him anything else that contravenes? See, this is a man who said that the Muslim was he who is soft, simple, and lenient. A man who taught us himself to be cautious from falling into extremism. See, he was never given two choices except he chose that which was easiest. Not for himself, but for his people and their convenience. See, I know a man who advocated for the freedom of the slaves. A man who taught us that the Muslim is the one from whom the people are safe. Not only from his hands, but even from the words that he says. See, this is a man who would never mock, mimic, nor ridicule, nor would he ever publicly rebuke an individual. This is the man I follow, so forgive me if this sounds unusual. 
But the man I know was so much more handsome, so beautiful. A man who taught kindness to the neighbors, who taught us to serve others without expecting back any favors, to spread peace to those we know and even to the strangers, to walk with humility and to simply ignore the haters. But nevertheless, I know a man who still taught us to stand up for the oppressed. From the men, women and children who call out to us in distress. I know a man who taught us to fight for these people. But by no means does this mean we have the right to transgress. For those who oppress have nothing to do with his name. So you can say what you wish to say and continue to defame his name But at the end of the day I assure you The man I follow was not the same Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I could just bring some of the verses that preach love in the Quran right here on the screen. The verses from the Quran that preach love and tolerance are from Muhammad's Meccan period. These are peace verses. Many verses that were allegedly revealed to Muhammad during his Medinan period were violent verses. Because the violent verses were revealed later, they abrogate the earlier peaceful verses. The Quran is a gradual revelation. Everything doesn't come out all at once. It starts off being peaceful and religious in the city of Mecca. But as the Quran is continually revealed, there is more and more violence. At first, violence is only defensive until finally it's full out offensive. Yet there is a clear difference between the teachings of the Quran when Muhammad was in Mecca at the beginning of his ministry and when he moved to Medina, the latter part of his ministry. While many of the verses from the Meccan part of his life were relatively peaceful in nature, they were replaced or abrogated by the violent verses of the Medinan per period. Does promote good just because there are people who do bad things because of it does not mean that it promotes the bad things what about the people like me what about the good people out there who have done so much for society of course I realize there are many wonderful Muslims who do good but you don't need Islam or any other religion to do good and like Richard Dawkins said of course religion isn't always used for evil but it can be used for evil I would assume you were raised to believe that religion is bad, or maybe the things around you have convinced you as such. It's interesting you mention that actually. I was born as a very moderate Christian, and I saw religion as being a force for good. But then I exposed myself to atheists on YouTube, and some public intellectuals like such as uh, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, and my view really changed on that. Like I said, religion can be used for good, but the bad far outweighs the good. Now, why is it that you want to force me astray from my religion? Force me astray are very strong words. I can't make you believe anything. I don't think belief is a choice, I think it's a conclusion. I have honestly examined the evidence and concluded that religions are not the truth and do more harm than good. Now, I support religious freedom, so as long as you are not a direct threat to anybody else, you should be free to practice whatever religion you want. But I also support freedom of speech, and I think no ideology should be immune from criticism, and that includes religion. So in short, I can't make you believe anything. You have the freedom to practice whatever religion you want, but I also have the freedom to criticize your religion. And we are taught that if we kill one human being, it's like killing all of humanity. If we save one human being, it's like saving all of humanity. I've noticed that some Muslim apologists will quote this verse after instances of violent Islamist attacks as proof that those who committed the attacks are not real Muslims, and they usually quote it as such. Whoever kills a person, it is as though he has killed all mankind, 
and whoever saves life, it is as though he had saved all mankind. That's Quran 532. But of course, they missed half the verse. Here is the verse in its entirety. Because of that, we have decreed upon the children of Israel, referring to the Jews, that whoever kills a soul unless for a soul or for corruption done in the land, it is as if he had slain mankind entirely. And whoever saves one, it is as if he had saved mankind entirely. And our messengers had certainly come to them with clear proofs. Then indeed, many of them, even after that throughout the land, were transgressors. I see this same verse misquoted over and over again. Here's an example. And another. And another. And some more. Why did the people who quote this verse leave most of it out? Let's read chapter 5, verse 32, and see what our friends omitted. Because of that, we ordained for the children of Israel, we ordained for the children of Israel, Allah ordained for the children of Israel. Islam's Western apologists go to the verse before it. They cut out the part about this being a teaching of the children of Israel, a quotation from the Talmud, and they claim that their severely edited, distorted verse, ripped from its context, proves that Islam is a religion of peace and tolerance. Critics always say that Muslims quote the verse, verse 532, out of context. Can you explain a little bit? Yeah, the verse itself is quoted by Muslims often to say that, uh, well, the verse says, if you kill one soul, that's like if you kill a whole people. So that shows the value of life in, in Islam. And now the critics are saying, well, wait a minute, don't you see that it actually says that this was prescribed for the people of Israel? But our response to that is that if something is given in the Quran of a, of a uh, basic moral nature, as opposed to ceremonial or legal prescriptions, then this applies to us as well. Next verse, Quran 5.33. Indeed, the penalty for those who wage war against Allah and His Messenger and strive upon earth to cause corruption is none but that they be killed or crucified or that their hands and feet be cut off from opposite sides or that they be exiled from the land. That is for them a disgrace in this world and for them in the hereafter is a great punishment.
Well, if you don't consider me to be a moral person because I said Islam makes me a good person, then what about the laws that make us good people? I think if you only do good because you fear punishment from the law, I would still not consider you to be a moral person. If you do good things just for the sake of doing good things, then I would consider you to be a moral person. This is where a lot of people make a big mistake. It does not say that you can get killed for leaving Islam in the Quran. But the Quran does say 91 times that the ideal Muslim is one who follows Muhammad. And Muhammad says in the Hadiths that apostates are to be killed. And I know you mentioned that some Hadiths are not authentic, but this particular verse that I'm looking at is from the most reliable Hadith source, Sahih al-Bukhari. I also have the book Reliance of the Traveler, a classic manual of Islamic sacred law, and it makes the punishment for apostasy very clear. On top of that, the punishment for apostasy in Saudi Arabia is death, so if you really think that this punishment is not Islamic, that would mean that Saudi Arabia is not practicing true Islam. Are you serious? <laughs>
seriously? <laughs> You're giving me an ultimatum? Two options that I have to take. I didn't say have to. I said there are two options that, in my eyes, you should take. No, go with the first one. Well, the person I was really thinking about when discussing the first option was Majid Nawaz. Even though he is a Muslim, I have a lot of respect for him because he recognizes that Islam needs reform. And often a bit of a tangent, but I would also recommend this book by Ayan Hirsi Lee called Heretic, Why Islam Needs the Reformation Now. That is never gonna happen. I'm sorry. I'm never leaving my religion for anything or anyone. I was actually having a conversation with a friend of mine who is an ex-Muslim. Uh, I asked him if he thought he, if he ever thought he would leave Islam as a Muslim, and he told me that he never thought he would leave Islam. And the way you, you spoke reminded him of his old convictions. He told me that now that he left, he felt mentally emancipated. Also, when you said I'm never leaving my religion for anything or anyone. You honestly sounded very dogmatic because you were essentially saying no matter what kind of evidence comes your way, you will... ...the saying no matter what kind of evidence comes your way, you will never ever change your mind. And regarding what I believe, I'm not claiming that I have absolute certainty. I could be wrong. I'm only doing my best at seeking truth and following the evidence wherever it leads me. What happened to the freedom of religion, freedom, uh, just freedom in general? Your name is Freedom Angst. Well, like I said, I do believe in freedom of religion, and by that I mean I think everybody should have the right to practice whatever religion they choose, so long as they're not a direct threat to anybody else's freedoms. And I can't make you believe anything, but if you really are concerned with freedom of religion, why aren't you speaking against countries like Saudi Arabia, where freedom of religion doesn't exist at all? Even in some Western countries, where we have freedom of religion, I've heard many stories of Muslims leaving their religion who were ostracized by their friends and family for doing so. Why aren't you speaking against these issues? As for the channel name, it's a reference to Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophy of existentialism. He believed that humans were radically free, and this freedom gives us angst or anxiety. I don't necessarily agree with Sartre, but that's just where the name comes from. It's a reference to his philosophy. Now, you aren't a nobody. That's why I responded to you, because you are a very smart kid, and I respect you a lot, because I love your... The way you write and the way you speak is just it's absolutely amazing and I can definitely be friends with you and I hope we could be friends, not that I have to leave the religion to do so. That does honestly mean a lot to me, so huge thanks for that, I really do appreciate it. Although in my original video, I wasn't referring to myself as a nobody. What I said was that I am a nobody on YouTube. My voice is not very loud and I'm very unheard of, so that's why I, I didn't expect you to respond to this. Join Islam. And, and, and test it out for yourself. Read the Quran, and and if you like it, go ahead. I have actually read the Quran. Uh, I have a small Quran collection of three different translations. And I'm not going to join Islam. And there are many reasons as to why, but one main reason is simply because I don't believe in God. I have honestly examined the evidence, but I cannot find any good evidence for God that can withstand scrutiny. So let's work with this logic. If the universe began, could it be created by nothing? Why? Because from nothing, nothing comes. If I have some nothing, and I add a little bit more nothing, and I add a little bit more nothing, and I sprinkle some nothing, and I do something else to the nothing, all I'm going to get is? Exactly, as in Urdu you say, Kuchne. And I heard there's a saying called Muchne the Kuchne, right? If you have a mustache, you have nothing. <laughs> Crazy stuff, man. Anyway, so moving along. So from nothing, nothing comes. 
Now, some atheists say, hold on one second, you have a quantum vacuum, and that's nothing, and you have particles emerging from this quantum vacuum. Now, what's a quantum vacuum? Let me make it simple for you. Imagine you had a huge cosmic hoover, and you sucked all the particles away from the universe. What's left is a quantum vacuum. Now, the quantum vacuum is not nothing. It's actually something. If you read a basic textbook on science, it's a sea of fluctuating energy. It's a rich structure. It obeys the laws of the universe. So they're wrong. It is not nothing. So something doesn't come from nothing. So the next point, could the universe create itself? Well, this is flawed. And let me give you a very crude example. Could your mother give birth to herself? That's a messy example, isn't it? Yeah? But the point is, this is wrong, right? Because self-creation implies that something existed and did not exist at the same time, which is a philosophical, logical contradiction. So the third point, could the universe be created by something else created ultimately? Well, intuitively, someone may say, well, maybe. Maybe this universe was created by another universe. But there's a problem here. Let's carry on the question. If this universe was as a result of something else created like another universe... And that is created, and therefore it requires another universe. And that universe was created by another universe. And that universe was created by another universe. And that universe was created by another universe. If that goes on forever, will we ever have this universe? No. So it shows that there must have been something that's uncreated that brought the whole of creation into being. Let me make this a little bit more simpler for you. Imagine I'm an American Marine, and I'm going to shoot a bird. If only they shot birds, right? <laughs> so, may Allah guide us all. So, if I'm going to shoot a bird, right? In order for me to shoot, I have to ask permission from the Marine behind me. If he has to ask permission, and that goes on forever, am I ever going to shoot the bird? Exactly. Similarly, ultimately, the universe must have been created by something uncreated, which makes sense of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If an atheist comes to you and says, give me proof that God exists, what is the proof you give? You say that you exist. That's the proof. You're standing in front of me. Tell him that there's a... Uh, tell him uh, that you're busy and you don't really have time to talk about this. Uh, and rather, I have an interesting story to tell you. It was on the news today. Uh, there was news of a uh, big ship that sailed out of China and it was loaded with electronic equipment and it went from Shanghai to Hong Kong from Hong Kong to Singapore from Singapore to uh, Aden from Aden to Alexandria and then went through the Mediterranean Sea and it ended up in Liverpool and the amazing thing is that that ship had no captain, there was no one on board. The police have proved that nobody loaded the ship with electronics. They also established through proof that those electronics were not made by any company. And the ship knew its way all the way to the United Kingdom without being guided by anyone. And they looked into it, there was no electronic equipment to guide it, nothing. On its own. What will he say? I think you lost your mind. Tell him, well, that's what I think about you. <laughs> you claim that we arrived here in dunya, we were born, we were nurtured, we were raised up. We have everything in dunya that we need, air, water, food. And all of that was done by no one. You don't believe that a ship can sail from one town to another and you want to tell me that the whole earth exists without having a... You make a big deal of one event that happened in India. You say it's impossible, it must have a captain. And then you want to say that this universe is managed without a manager. By the way, this uh, example that I quoted I, uh, with a few modifications to make it relevant to our time this was actually an example uh, that was originally given by Imam Abu Hanifa to an atheist mm -hmm. 
And one more thing, I did make a video response to you a, a few days prior to this one. It's called, Why Do Atheists Talk About Religion So Much? So the link to that video will be in an annotation on the screen. And it features some music I actually made myself. So this is the end of the video though. Uh, thank you for watching. Once again, thanks for responding to me, Kareem. And on a final note, I can't force you to believe anything, but I do ask that you at least think about what I had to say in this video. More thing, I did make a video response to you a, fr a few days prior to this one. It's called why do atheists talk about religion so much? So the link to that video will be in an annotation on the screen. And it features some music I actually made myself. So this is the end of the video though. Uh, thank you for watching. Once again, thanks for responding to me, Kareem. And on a final note, I can't force you to believe anything, but I do ask that you at least think about what I had to say in this video. On your trip abroad, you said you sensed a feeling of great brotherhood. While I was at Mecca making the pilgrimage, the, I spoke about the brotherhood that existed at all levels and among all people who were there on that hajj who had accepted the religion of Islam. And I pointed out that uh, for what it had done, what the religion of Islam had done for those people over there, despite their complexion differences, that it would probably uh, do America well to study the religion of Islam and perhaps it could drive some of, some of the racism from this society as it has driven racism from the Muslim society. When I was in on the pilgrimage, I had close contact with Muslims whose skin would in America be classified as white and with Muslims who would themselves would be classified as white in America. But these particular Muslims didn't call themselves white. They looked upon themselves as human beings, as part of the human family, and therefore they looked upon all other segments of the human family as part of that same family. Well, now, uh, they had a different look or a different air or a different attitude than that which is uh, reflected in the uh, attitude of the man in America who calls himself white. So I said that if uh, Islam had done that for them, Perhaps if the white man in America would study Islam, perhaps they could do the same thing for him. يا أيها الناس إن خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا. إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير. According to the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control in the USA, alcohol-related vehicle crashes kill someone every 32 minutes, and non-fatal injuries occur every two minutes. Fatalities involving alcohol accounted for 40% of all traffic deaths in the year 2000 and drugs other than alcohol were factors in an additional 18% of all deaths. Alcohol related accidents totaled a cost of over $51 billion in the year 2000 alone. The negative effect of alcohol and drugs in our so-called civilized society cannot be denied. Everyone in our so-called advanced societies has in some way been affected by the evils of these vices. Also, the National Crime Victimization Survey in the USA reports that 28% of the victims of violence reported that their attacker was under the influence of alcohol alone or in combination with other drugs. Furthermore, alcohol-related acts of workplace violence accounted for 35% of all incidents and 25% of jail inmates said that they were under the influence while arguing with family, friends, spouses, etc. Now think of the countless incidents of senseless violence that could have been avoided had neither alcohol nor drugs been involved. Islam is the only world religion that addresses the evils of alcohol and drugs in its texts 
and removes any ambiguity as to the position of Islam on the issue. Yeah. What is evident is that not only does the Quran address the purpose of alcohol and drugs as a means of causing hatred between people and as a distraction from worship, but also in the same verses it condemns the destructive vice of gambling as well. Now name one other system that has inspired almost a quarter of the world's population to completely turn away from alcohol, drugs and gambling just as Islam has done.